Hey everybody, Aaron Bishop here from Derish Chai on behalf of the Patterns of Life Bible. I know it's been a little while since we've done a video. Uh, it's been a lot going on around here. We're almost done with phase three, just a little bit of Ezekiel and the books of the Kings, and we are done with phase three and it will be released for public viewing. Until then, uh, we've been pouring all of our time into working on uh, getting these books of the prophets settled and ready to go and, and in the best condition possible that we can uh, achieve with the uh, manpower that we currently have to uh, to bring it to you, to make it available to you so that uh, you can now enjoy uh, the, the books of the prophets as well. And when I say the prophets, it's not the prophets according to the modern uh, Western understanding of what the books of the prophets are. It'll be the books of the prophets according to the Hebraic understanding. And Hebraic understanding, the... Hebrew scriptures, the, the Old Testament, is split into three sections it's called the, the Tanakh. There's the Torah, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings. And so the prophets includes books like Joshua, Judges, um, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, as well as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, all of those other books, they're, they're all part of this prophet's release. So it is a huge release that's uh, coming your way here shortly. Until then, I uh, just wanted to make a series of videos here to uh, thank our patrons and to kind of dive deeper into these patterns um, and to provide extra content for those who are supporting this project. Our thanks to you. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. So let's go ahead and dive in. For today, we are going to look at Matthew Pericope 7. Matthew Pericope 7. Uh, this is the proclamation of John the Baptist. It's found here in Matthew chapter 3. It's also found in Luke chapter 3. Nearly the exact same story in both places. So we decided to go with the, uh, the Matthew version today. And it recounts the story of John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And he is preaching a me message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then at the, uh, at the end of it, at the end of the section in verse 12, it says his fan is in his hand and he will purge the floor, gather the wheat into his garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So it's the, uh, it's the hand, it's, it's at hand, it's right there, it's, it's close, it's tangible, it's touchable. And then in B, we see that uh, he is the one who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, saying, this is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then in B prime, it says, I baptize you with water into repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So in the first one, it's preparing for. And who is he preparing for? He's preparing for, in B prime, the one who is coming after him. So it's a... It's a continuation of a single idea here on each side of this uh, central portion of this pericope. Then in C, uh, and the same John, this is the same John the Baptist who wore garments of camel's hair, had a leather girdle about his waist, uh, and his uh, food was locusts and wild honey. So speaking of his food, what he ate. Um, but then in C prime it says, and now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So we see it's talking about fruit, it's about what people eat, it's about taking something in. Uh, it's this idea of um, food, fruit being something that comes from the earth uh, and that, or that comes from people even, and that others can then partake in. In D, in D he's, we see that he went out into the Jer Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around the Jordan, and they were baptized him confessing their sins. And then in D prime, bring forth the fruit to meet with repentance. So we have confession and re repentance juxtaposed to each other in D. And think not to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And then in E, and this is the, the very central part of this. It says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So this the rebuke of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to see him as if he was some sort of sideshow. And uh, he calls them a brood of vipers. And then who warned you to flee from the wrath 
to come. And that's kind of, uh, I think, the, the important thing that we need to grasp onto here. Because what is it that we hear often, uh, especially in Pentecostal circles, deliverance circles, so on and so forth, uh, we hear that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay. And we usually hear of these compared to each other as if it's the same thing just being repeated, a parallelism of sorts. But it, what it's describing here in context isn't a parallel. It's a contrast. It's a contrast of ideas. Because the very next verse, verse 12, whose fan is in his hands and he will purge his floor, gather the wheat into the gardener, garner and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's talking about Jesus is coming and he's going to baptize with the spirit, this group of people who are wheat, who are bearing fruit, who are doing good works, who are operating in faith. And this group of people he's going to baptize with fire, the judgment that is to come. It's not the same thing. It's not, I'm baptizing you with fire. That's not a good thing to be baptized with fire. And unfortunately, in so many circles, it has become a good thing to be baptized in fire. So let's actually look at uh, what the scripture has to say. The, the Many times the Bible compares the spirit to fire. Let's just let it speak for itself. I, I don't like to uh, add to the Bible, and I, I want the Bible to be able to interpret the Bible. Um, and so if I'm wrong, we need to find it within the pages of scripture. So the first place that everybody thinks of, oh, well, obviously, he's talking about the day of Pentecost, right? Acts 2, verses 3 through 4, the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and it appears as though it's tongues of fire, right? They're baptized in the Spirit and in fire, right there. See, it's clear as day. But I want to draw your attention to Exodus chapter 34. When Moses goes up to the mountain for the second time for the renewing of the covenant that had been broken previously at the golden calf, he comes down from the mountain, and it's described as though he has horns of light coming from his head. Could it be that the horns of light that's described there is the same tongues of fire that we read of in Acts? And baptism in the Holy Spirit? It's not described as fire in Exodus, but it is in Acts, and that could just be interpretive... Uh, it just could be could just be the author's interpretation of what's happening, what he sees. Uh, it kind of looks like fire. Oh, well, this guy, he saw it, and he said, well, it kind of looks like a, a horn coming from his head of light. Okay. So what else does the scripture have to say on the Holy Spirit in connection to fire? Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. It says, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. The spirit of fire is judgment. And it is this that is going to cleanse Jerusalem. It's going to cleanse the bloodshed from the midst of Jerusalem. Where else does the Bible describe the Holy Spirit and compare it to fire? Well, there's Matthew 3, Luke 3, the, this passage that we're reading here. And that's it. Those are the only places in all of scripture where the Holy Spirit is compared to fire. Two places, three places actually, Matthew 3, Luke 3, and Isaiah 4, the spirit of fire is a spirit of judgment. It is a burning away of evil, of the evil ones. The only time that you could make the case that the Holy Spirit and baptism of fire is a good thing, is in the description that Luke gives in Acts chapter 2. The, the way that he describes what the Spirit looked like on the people. And the case could be made for 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, where it says, do not quench the Spirit. The word quench, right? It's something that you do to a fire. You quench a fire. And so the case could be made that that is kind of comparing the spirit to a fire. But that's it. 
every time that this that scripture comes out and makes a direct comparison of the Holy Spirit to fire, it is in judgment. It's not something that we want to be pouring out on our brothers and sisters. When Now, the fact is, when you come to Jesus, when you come have that salvation moment, you come to the cross for the first time, you enter into judgment before God. You, you, you willingly take on his judgment in that moment. And it could be said that the Holy Spirit comes in and it burns away all of the evil, all of the darkness within you, and it replaces it with the Holy Spirit. The case could be made for that. But I don't know that we should be calling down fire on our brethren. Just think about it. That's all I ask. Just think about it. So with that, I hope to see you next time. And uh, we will going to begin a uh, Genesis, early Genesis uh, study where we go through the, uh, the early chapters of the book of Genesis and compare and contrast them using the pericopes that are present in scripture. So take care, everybody. Hope to see you here next time.